Hi everyone, I'm Connie Burton and I just did a video interview with Dr. Robin Armstrong. He's been catapulted into the news because he treated his nursing home patients with hydroxychloroquine. And although much of the media has made that a political story, I think you're gonna get a whole different side of this um, as you listen to Dr. Armstrong explain um, why he used hydroxychloroquine for his nursing home patients, the effectiveness of it, um, all the things that his particular facility went through. Um, not only that, we talked about COVID-19 um, on the general population. We talked about face masks. We talked about how it's contracted. It's really great information, and it's not through the lens of a liberal media outlet. It's just information that you can use. So please take a listen. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we have Dr. Robin Armstrong on with us. And before we get started, I want to read to you all um, his bio, and then we're going to get straight into um, some questions for him. So first and foremost, Dr. Robin Armstrong was born in Texas City and reared in nearby Lamarck in Galveston County. He has a bachelor's degree in microbiology, excuse me, from Texas A&M University in College Station. I can hear all the whoops going up right now, uh, and a medical degree from the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston. He did his residency in internal medicine. He is on the staff of Mainland Medical Center in Texas City. The hospital is located down the street from his boyhood home. He was the 2006 president of the Galveston County Medical Society. He graduated from Lamarck High School, at which he was a wide receiver on the Cougars football team that played in the 5A state championship in 1987. He also ran the 800 meters and the two-mile relay in track and field. I always like these kinds of things. It kind of makes you know it personal and kind of get, helps us to know who you are, Dr. Armstrong. Uh, Dr. Armstrong became a Christian during his sophomore year at Texas A&M and has traveled on missionary journeys to Africa and Nicaragua. He has worked in inner city and youth ministry at his church, the Abundant Life Christian Center in Lamarck, Texas, where he leads a men's Bible study group. Thank you so much, Dr. Armstrong, for joining me today. I really Thank appreciate you. it. Thanks for having me. It's good to be on. You bet. So the reason that we have you on, uh, Dr. Armstrong, is you and I have met before. We we know each other, um, but you were catapulted in the news <laughs> recently. And unfortunately, uh, much of the media um, uh, put you in the news from a political perspective. And um, I know uh, now owning and running the Texan news site that, you know, people just want factual reporting of the news. They don't want narratives. They don't want spin. They just want information. And right now, particularly during this coronavirus um, pandemic that we've had going on now for some time, you know, people just want information. So <clears throat> because all the information that I read was from a political nature, I wanted to have you on. Let's talk about what you went through, what you're doing. And, and let me just say uh, quickly to the readers, excuse me, to the listeners, that um, he was catapulted into the into media news because he was treating uh, residents at a uh, at a nursing home where he's the medical director with hydroxychloroquine. And that is what catapulted him. So let's, so let's start from the beginning. First and foremost, tell me a little bit about, I don't really know what internal medicine doctor is. Can you, let's kind of give us a little bit more of your background, if you, if you will, please, before we get into the specifics, tell me about that. So an internal medicine doctor is a physician that does uh, adult medicine. And so uh, we take care of, patients in the hospital, patients in the clinic as well. And so we, um, we manage those folks um, who have chronic medical problems. And so it, it's adult medicine. And so we don't have any, do any pediatrics at all. It's basically adult medicine. And so we're kind of specialists with adult medicine. And so I actually am a hospitalist, which is a subsection of internal medicine. So I'm internal medicine trained, but I do hospitalist works, which work, which means I take care of patients in the hospital. And so, and I also have a nursing home practice as well. I actually own my own medical group, Armstrong Medical Group. And so we have a hospital practice and a nursing home practice. But our main practice actually is in the hospital and just the nursing home is something that's, that, that, that's more recent. We have quite a number of nursing home patients now because it's just been an offshoot 
of our hospital-based practice. And so internal medicine is a specialty uh, that's, that does adult medicine. And so we take care of folks with hypertension, diabetes, you know, um, um, all those chronic medical problems, dyslipidemia, coronary artery disease, strokes and stuff like that. And so wow. it's, it's broad, broad practice. Wow. Interesting. And so again, how long, give us an idea. I said the date, but how long have you been doing this now? Boy, for, for, for almost, almost 20 years. Uh, wow. my, um, my first day of medical practice was, was at the hospital where I was born. And that's Mainland Medical Center Hospital. It was a county hospital. And my first day was September 11th, 2001. That was my very first wow. day of starting my practice. And so, um, so yeah, so it's it been almost 20 years since I've been practicing. Wow. Wow. Okay. Um, so, obviously, again, as I mentioned earlier, you're the medical director. I believe that's the correct title at this nursing home correct. in Texas city correct that is and, correct uh, okay and so there was a um that nursing home was hard hit with coronavirus <laughs> and i believe it was 27 patients who were infected with this virus um give us a, a feel for tell us give us the specifics of that um and how did you see this coming on why do you think there was a cluster you know the that kind of information well, hey, I'll tell you, so there were actually there were actually 56 patients oh. that were infected so there are 56 residents that were infected uh, with the coronavirus and there were actually 31 staff members 31 employees and so wow. total, there was 80 something patients 87 patients 87 folks in that nursing facility that were infected with the coronavirus. And so that that the the, the Texas um, so what happened initially was there were three um, staff members, three physical therapists that were infected, and so they were they were the first folks that we saw uh, that, that that had the coronavirus infection, and and once that was discovered that those staff members were infected, then obviously those staff members are going to work with. With with much of the building, many of the residents in the building, mm -hmm. and so and so there was a concern amongst the Galveston County Health Department that that we may have a lot of residents infected because of those staff members that were infected, and so and so that and that's indeed what had happened. So the Department of, of Health in Galveston County came in and tested every resident, every employee. Literally every human that was walking within 100 feet of that building got tested for the COVID-19 virus. And it turns out that there were 56 positive um, residents, 31 positive uh, staff members. And so it really devastated this nursing facility. Mm. So um, why the cluster in nursing homes? What is happening in nursing homes now, it, it, and that's nursing homes all over Louisiana, all over the state of Texas, have had many, many deaths. You saw the cases in Washington State where, um, like, I, I believe 22 residents died in that nursing facility of COVID-19. Um, in Louisiana, they're being devastated in their nursing facilities. The reason we're seeing that take place, certainly in this area, it, it, the cluster in nursing homes is because of, um, because nursing homes have a practice of shared employees. And so what they do is, is, is many of these folks are really hardworking folks. They're, they're nurses, they're, they're, they're physical therapists, physical therapy assistants, occupational therapists, and they're extremely hardworking. And so they don't oftentimes get enough hours that they want to work in one nursing facility. And so what they do is they have a, a shared employee model in Texas. So, so many different staff members will work at multiple nursing homes. And so these same physical therapists that worked in this one nursing home, they probably worked in two or three nursing homes as well. And so that's why you see clusters in the nursing home. It's not that the that the patients are are infected. Actually, it's actually the employees, the healthcare workers that are bringing the, the, the COVID-19 virus into the nursing homes. And so that's how these clusters start. And I'm certain that's the case in, 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 in all over the country as well. Wow. Okay. That makes total sense. My daughter is in physical therapy and she was talking about, um, you know, you can go into these different areas. It's just obviously like doctors, like many right. occupations where you're right. very specialized. And she said herself, you know, you can work with elderly patients only, you know, right. sports patients, et cetera. Right. So that makes total sense um, to me. I see. Okay. Um, that's actually something I hadn't heard before. 
So, so something that I probably should have asked beforehand, do you remember when this started happening in your particular nursing home, where we were in the country and even the state with COVID-19? Like, were we already at, uh, you know, stay at home orders? Did we already have those in place? Do you recall? Well, the nursing homes certainly had them in place. And so the nursing homes had orders where the, the, the patients, actually, when we got uh, this in, when we got this cluster at the nurse, this particular nursing home, um, the, the families had not been allowed to visit them for, for two weeks prior to this. And so, yeah. And so yeah, so we had, um, we, we, we had the stay at home orders um, and, and the families hadn't been allowed to, allowed to visit. But but, you know, obviously the staff were still allowed in. Sure. I don't think it was quite as stringent as it is now. So so they weren't checking temperatures like they are now. Um, they weren't going through the COVID-19 question and answer that they are doing now. So they were not doing that. But it was kind of things were kind of getting started. Okay. And so um, and so we were starting to clamp down a little bit more, but but not, um, you know, not completely yet. Sure. So. What are, for your nursing home patients, for your specific situation, what were the physical symptoms that you were seeing in your patients that made you begin to think it could be COVID-19? Well, what was happening is, you know, you know, honestly, at our patients, you know, they weren't really having symptoms at all. It's just the health department came in and decided to treat oh. it. And so, and so actually, in retrospect, we did have folks that were having symptoms but when 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 the health department got wind that these staff members, employees were infected, then they knew that there were probably going to be a large number of residents infected as well. So the decision to come in and test everybody was done by the health department director in Galveston County. And he just decided that he was going to test everyone. And, and oh. so um, so it was. And so that's that's how that decision came about. And so certainly in retrospect, we can see that our folks were starting to have symptoms, but we didn't expect that we were going to have this many. And so when we got the diagnosis, then we started watching these patients very, very closely. And then we started looking for symptoms to see because our the evidence had shown in other nursing facilities that that, of course, when you talk about elderly people, you know, they're going to have lots of comorbid conditions. And so they're going to have hypertension and diabetes and congestive heart failure, dyslipidemia, all these medical problems. And so they're going to have less reserve than young people are, mm. are going to have. And so I had actually taken care of some COVID-19 patients in the hospital that were younger. And so these patients would be hypoxic, which means their oxygen level would be low, usually for for a, a week or two. And so these folks would have low oxygen saturations. We would have them on on high oxygen flows in the hospital. And we were treating a lot of them with hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. But but the young pa patients can withstand that for a while. And so we can be a little more conservative with them. Elderly patients are not going to have the reserve to be able to withstand that hypoxia for that long a period of time. You know, they're going to have a stroke or they're going to have a heart attack because they just don't have the reserve. They've got so many other medical problems. I see. So what do you consider when you say elderly? What are uh, you considering elderly? Or what does everybody, what does the medical community consider so, elderly? So I think elderly is generally 65 and over, okay. but, but that's just the number. You know, yeah. I, I'll yeah. say yeah. that that we I, I have some folks that I've come across who are 80, 85 years old and they're ambulatory. They're walking around. They're, they're interacting with people. Their mind is sharp. And so that person certainly is 85 chronologically, but medically they're not 85. And Got then at it. the same time, we have patients who are in their 40s who have mm -hmm. hypertension and end stage renal disease and congestive heart failure. So that person may be in their 40s. But medically, they're likely, you know, 80. Sure. And so, so, that, there, so there's a bit. So a, the, the elderly is just a number. But, but the number doesn't matter nearly as much as the, the medical problems and the comorbid conditions. Got and it. generally, generally in the nursing home, and our nursing home is not any different than any other. Uh, most, but most of the folks are elderly. Most of the folks are older uh, okay. because generally that's generally who's the sickest in our society is, the, is those who are elderly. But you do have some young people with chronic medical problems as well. We have some elderly, older people chronologically that do very well medically. I see. And is your nursing home... Uh, 
does it have any kind of hospital type before again, mainly I want to get into the hydrochloroquine, uh, obviously, but first and foremost, do y'all just uh, uh, give medications and then if they need anything more, they go to a hospital or do you have hospital type equipment there at your particular nursing home? Oh, no, there's really not, there's really not a lot of hospital equipment. We do have the ability to do IVs. And so if they're on the skilled nursing side, we can do IVs, we can do IV hydration, we can do some IV antibiotics. Um, you know, we don't have telemetry monitoring. Uh, we can get EKGs, we can get x-rays and stuff like that, but it's not a hospital. Um, usually if we order labs, we're going to get the labs. In a hospital, you can get stat labs in 15, 20 minutes. In a right. nursing facility, those stat labs are probably going to be, you know, a few hours. And I so see. things are not going to be as efficient as the hospital. You don't have all of the capability as a hospital. You know, you try to keep them there um, in place and you do everything that you can to keep them there because it's safer for elderly folks to be there as opposed to the hospital. Right. But, um, but, but it's not a hospital. It's, it's certainly a, a big step down from a hospital. Okay. Okay. All right. So let's get straight to the hydroxychloroquine. Now, what at what point did you decide that you wanted to – uh, prescribe uh, this medication for your patients? What made you decide to use that? So what we saw was, you know, we all we had was the experience in Washington State where, you know, you know, 27% of those patients died. And we had the experience that we've seen in, in, in Louisiana. We've had the experience um, in some nursing homes in, in here in, in San Antonio, they had a horrible outbreak where a lot of people died. And so we had the experience in, in, in different states, in Richmond, Virginia as well, where they had a, t a lot of people pass away in the nursing homes. So, and, and in Tennessee, where they just unloaded the nursing home, they just sent all those patients to the hospital. And so we didn't think that those, either of those were good options for, for our patients. We thought that that was going to certainly increase their morbidity and mortality. Um, out, out of studies in China and studies in France, it showed that the, the mortality rate for this group of folks is 15 to 20 percent. And so and so if you have 56 patients that are infected, you can expect nine to 10 of those patients to die. That's mm. just what's out of the statistics. And so, you know, we obviously were not you know, willing to, um, to to accept that. And so we thought, you know, what can we do? Uh, we, we started looking at, at studies in China, start looking at studies in France. And we had heard about these as physicians. You know, and in the hospital, I had used hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin on on some patients in the hospital. We saw some some good success, um, not success with everyone, but some some moderate success. And so we decided, you know, that these are safe medications. Um, we've all prescribed hydroxychloroquine to our lupus patients and rheumatoid arthritis patients, and they had a a good safety profile. They've been around for 80 years. And we also, everyone's taken a Z pack. Anybody's, you know, that's and that's essentially what azithromycin is. Wow. And then zinc is a vitamin, which we also treated them with zinc. And so it's been some studies to show that zinc is helpful. And so what we did was we decided that we would try and shelter these persons in place, keep them in their nursing facility, take care of them there. This is their home. This is what they're familiar with. And they're actually safer here and will do better here because the mortality rates for elderly people in the hospital is extremely high. Mm. And so and so and if they get uh, ventil get intubated and placed on a ventilator, then their mortality rate is even higher. And mm. so our goal was to keep them in place and, and to treat them as best we could there. Um, hydroxychloroquine and, and azithromycin were, and zinc were the only options there that we had. Uh, we mm. figured that our the safety profile for these medications was actually pretty good because they've been around for a long time. And so we thought, you know, let's go ahead and and, and start, you know, treating these folks, you know, on these medications, treating them a little bit earlier than, than has been done um, and, and see if we can prevent these folks from getting worse. And so we only treated people who had symptoms. And so we watched them very closely. We rounded on them every day and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and managed them there. We had two physicians there. We had a nurse practitioner. We had a, a, a supporting nurse that works actually works for me. And so we really put a lot of resources and we paid for, we bought our own PPE, per, personal protective equipment as well. So we spent money out of our own company's budget, you know, on PPE to protect our folks. And, and, and also, um, on, and then we, then I used a lot of um, the resources to try and get the medications as well. And so, and so we went through that whole process because our goal was to not overwhelm the hospitals 
mm-hmm. which which was a big problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, many of these folks, if they go to the hospital, were going to end up on the ventilator, mm-hmm. and so we didn't want to overwhelm our hospital system, and 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 we didn't want to um to um you know see the mortality of these patients go up so high, and so we decided that it would be safer for them, better for them to treat them in the nursing facility with these medications uh, that were pretty safe and, and the only meds that showed could have some benefit. And so it, it's really interesting that people have made it a political discussion because, um, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't care about hydroxychloroquine either way. You know, it's a, it's right. a medication, it's a tool, it's a, the tool that we had. And so we decided to, to, to use that to see if it would be helpful knowing that our patients would be safe. So the, Which the, is what, by the way, doctors do every day. Right, absolutely, <laughs> right? absolutely. Why it's all of, a, all of a sudden become a political decision is beyond me and very frustrating. Right. And why right. I wanted to hear all of this from you specifically, um, because th- this is what doctors do to try right. to treat uh, disease. Um, and so, so help me to understand uh, what it is that hydroxychloroquine does in the body itself, to the disease itself, that causes people to uh, heal from it. Uh, is there? Do y'all know yet, frankly, or you know, can you explain that? So, so th- there were some studies in China that have shown that the, the the pathophysiologic mechanism for hydroxychloroquine is what it does. It it's not a, a drug that actually kills the virus, and so it doesn't kill the virus per se. But what it does is it affects the virus's functionality, okay? And so it, so the, the proposed mechanism is, is, is hydroxychloroquine blocks some receptors on our cells. The way viruses live, the only way that viruses, because they can't live really outside of a host. And so they have to have a host cell to survive. And so, so they, the way they heal, the way they survive is they have to attach to our cells and when they attach to our cells, they inject their DNA or RNA, depending on what type of virus it is, and then they basically hijack the cell. And so, and so they start causing our cells to produce lots and lots and lots of viruses, and then they kill our cell, and then they continue to multiply and infect other cells. So what hydroxychloroquine does is it actually blocks the receptor on our cell, so it prevents the virus from attaching to the cell. And so it blocks those receptors, and it also alkalinizes the inside of the cell um, in, in, in combination with zinc. And, and that also affects how the virus attaches to the cell. So if the virus cannot attach to the cell, then the virus is not going to be able to survive. And so, and, so, and so with that pathophysiology, it makes sense to me that, that the only way that hydroxychloroquine would be effective is if you used it early on in the disease course as opposed to late. And so every study that's come out, every study, there was a New England Journal study that was that was very politically released early, and 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 it, they they violated every scientific principle by releasing that study early. And, and and that study got released early. The New England Journal actually pulled it back and would not release it. And, and what, but somebody, some liberal got hold of it and released it early that said that hydroxychloroquine has no benefit. In fact, it causes things to get worse in pieces. Well, every study that's been done, even this Chinese study that, that recently came out with 150 patients, these were all hospitalized patients. And, and my contention is that once the patient is hospitalized and, and the viral load is so high, it's too late at that point, and hydroxychloroquine is not going to be effective in those patients. And so every study that has said hydroxychloroquine doesn't work is a study on hospitalized patients who have been in the hospital. I believe that medications like remdesivir are probably better in the hospital setting. I believe that that medications like 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 maybe the HIV medications that they're using, um, medications that that directly kill the virus are going to be better when those viral loads are really high like that. And so um, and so that that's how it works. And and there was one study that showed that when you add azithromycin to it. Then, 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 then you clear the virus a lot faster, and so we really don't necessarily understand the mechanism of how, of how azithromycin works with that. It has some sort of immunomodulatory effects that we really don't know. Um, and then zinc actually allows for it opens channels and allows for hydroxychloroquine to get inside of the cell and and and, and make that process even more effective. And so um, that's kind of how how it works. That's that's 
I will tell you that's fascinating and absolutely eye-opening, the aspect that you talked about how the uh, these patients who are already in the hospital and obviously further along in the disease process right. is why uh, uh, how, uh, 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 why do I all of a sudden I've heard hydroclox, I mean, I, I'm obviously not a doctor, so that's not on the tip of my tongue. Hydro, hydro, hydroxychloroquine, sorry. <laughs> that's obviously why hydroxychloroquine uh, is showing not to be effective because they are further along in the right. disease. Oh my goodness. That's, that's really valuable information. I appreciate so, you know, hearing that. What's uh-huh. really funny is that, is that, you know, I'm, I'm, that just makes sense to me. You know, and so all the scientists are saying, I mean, I'm I'm not like I'm not a super brilliant, smart guy. You know what I mean? But that just makes yeah. sense to me. So no one is saying that. No one's right. saying that at all. That that every study that's come out are patients that are hospitalized. And 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 it, it just makes so much sense to me because clearly um we've had an effect and and, and so I'm not, you know, like I say, I'm not pro-hydroxychloroquine or, or anti-hydroxychloroquine. I'm just trying to treat the patients and, and we're right. going to just report on our experience. And our experience exactly. has been that it hasn't been effective. Wow, that's awesome. Exactly. That's what's so frustrating to me is let's just, people just want to know, right? And and we know, we I mean, doctors want to treat their patients. They That's what you are there for, is to help them heal and get better. Um, and, you know, that's why I just want to get this information from you, because it's so frustrating that it's become political and that people are making up straw man arguments all the time, just like this, you know, for somebody to come out and say hydroxychloroquine is not effective when it's actually uh, only because they are further along in the disease or people who are already hospitalized. Well, nobody's arguing that it's uh, just like you said, nobody's making that that argument, but they're arguing with themselves, (laughs) right? You know, by coming out with that kind of a headline. Um, Wow. That's just, that's really interesting. So, so what is, you know, we're, we're kind of off and on hearing about the supplies of hydroxychloroquine. And I know I've had people on my um, Facebook page when I've talked about it. We had an article uh, early on about some uh, emergency room doctors who were using hydroxychloroquine and were very successful. Um, and, you know, we had, I had some people come on to the post and say, you know, they're so happy about that. However, they have lupus and have been treated with hydroxychloroquine for sure. years. And it was a little bit hard to get um, right. at that tw- at that time. Right. Because people were uh, I don't know, governments perhaps were trying to uh, store it up uh, in case it was needed. What are you seeing these days? Are, are the regular patients of hydroxychloroquine able to get it? Do you think um, what's happening there? You know, so I don't think that there's going to be an issue at all with, with getting it. I mean, I, I, the, the, the demand, the supply is going to increase with the demand. And, and right. so I know that, that that Bayer, you know, produces it and and they're going to produce plenty that we need there. I know that there's a stockpile right now sitting in San Antonio that no one's using, you know, that, that that's under the got under the care of the state board of pharmacy. You know, so right. we got the medicine from the state board of pharmacy, you know, through a hospital. And so, right. and so um, uh, you know, Senator Brian Hughes was extremely helpful in 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 in, in, in you know, sort of making sure that that shipment got here. And so and so it, it's I don't think that there's going to be an issue with the supply at all. You know, and, 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 and hydroxychloroquine actually does hang around the body for quite a while. And so I think that most of those patients are going to be fine. Um, usually it has about a half life of 22 days. And so it'll actually be within your system. And so um, and so if you you know what they what the what the government has done, I know the Texas Medical Board here has actually restricted the use of hydroxychloroquine for uh, for COVID-19 patients up to 14 days. And so they say you can't prescribe it for longer than 14 days for this usage. And so they're trying to, <clears throat> which I think is appropriate because for, for COVID-19, you don't need it. We just, our treatment course was for five days. And so is it's, that right? Five days only? Oh, it's only five days. Wow. So That's something not, else I didn't know. And so it's not like it's a you know prolonged course or anything. It's just for five days. And so it's so we're not going to be um, the problem is that there's a scare and a lot of folks are hoarding the hydroxychloroquine. Doctors sure. are even hoarding it, which is not appropriate, you know. But but that's what's happening. Um, and so it, it's it's uh, it's amazing to me that that there's been all this um, 
you know, all this negative publicity about it. And and don't forget, you know, doctors and, and the medical establishment is 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 pretty liberal as well. And yes. so so those guys are, are are not above playing politics with a lot of this this also. Um, I saw a, an article the other day, um, and it was put out by a lot of different uh, medical organizations, and I was happy to see it, it, what they said in the article. And what they said was, was they were talking about all the different possible treatments for COVID-19, and they said this about remdesivir, and they said this about Lytonavir, a Kaletra, the HIV med that's being studied, and they said this about hydroxychloroquine. They said that we cannot, you know, um, confirm that it is good. We cannot confirm that it is not good. You know, we can't confirm that it works for COVID-19, but we can't say that it doesn't work either. And so I, I appreciated that because that is a fair statement. I was sure. surprised to see it because a <laughs> lot of the medical journals were saying, you know, do not use it, do not use it. It's not good. But but I was I was happy to see that that this organization said, you know, listen, we, we're not saying it works, but we're not saying it doesn't work either. Because right. I'll t- I think there's going to be a lot of evidence. You know, in the, in the nation of India right now, um, I have a friend who's a physician, and there's a lot of Indian physician friends that I have, and they have lots of family in India. In India, they're taking hydroxychloroquine prophylactically. And so, really? and so, they're, so they're taking it prophylactically in a lot of countries. You know, is it? It's ironic that we haven't seen a big cluster of COVID nineteen in Africa. You know, it's because they they take chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine for malaria prophylaxis. And so, and so, it, it's just people are making these associations. You know, one thing that that that, and I haven't seen this study, uh, but I've just heard it anecdotally that 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 a lot of, we're not getting um, um, our, our lupus patients and our rheumatoid arthritis patients who are taking hydroxychloroquine you know they're 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 not be, they're not getting covid-19 and so and so it's wow. it's a, so it's a, it's kind of an interesting and those, those are anecdotal those are not scientific sure. studies but i think it's important to to acknowledge that you know, and, and and just to say, hey, look, th- this is this is a p- potential benefit here. Absolutely. I'm not saying it's a panacea. I'm not saying it's a cure. I'm just saying that it certainly seems like it helped in the population that w- that we were serving here. Exactly. And again, this is what the medical community does on a regular basis right. with all diseases, new diseases. I mean, you 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 test different things out to see what works best for that particular patient, right? right. So I, it just again it. It boggles my mind that this is all so extraordinary when it's the regular practice of medicine, as far as I can tell, uh, in my lifetime. This is how, you know, um, you approach diseases, how doctors do. So uh, I'm with you on that. Can we, I want to back up a little bit to the Texas Board of Pharmacy. You know, and I was in the state Senate and yet had nothing to do with the Texas Board of Pharmacy. I guess I wasn't on the committee that, although I was on Health and Human Services, but it was just not something that I ever really had to, de- to deal with. Kind of explain that to the people out there that may not know what the Texas Board of Pharmacy is or what their purpose is or why they have this uh, medication, that kind of thing? Well, so so they basically, um, you know, how they, 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 this big shipment of medications went to them because they sort of, you know, house the medications and they, they are, they are the ones who, um, who sort of distribute the medications out. And so, and so they, they're the ones that distribute it to the hospitals and distribute it to the different organizations and such. And so they, that's why they receive this medication. Um, so um, they actually, their, 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 their uh, purview has been expanded recently because now they, they are, are over the controlled substances. And so a lot of the, um, a lot of the legislation that's coming down on controlled substances is being controlled by the state board of pharmacy as well. Like our DEA numbers are now issued through them. And so it's it's just a, it, they have an expanded role now uh, that they haven't had before because of the controlled substances. And so a lot of the medications are coming through them. And so that's why it went to them. And that's the proper state channel. You know, I certainly um, made contact with uh, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, who was very helpful to me. Um, he put me in contact with Brian Hughes, who I, I called, and then and they basically said you need to put in a STAR request to get the medication because they were in the State Board of Pharmacy. And the STAR request is a requisition that can be done by hospitals or it can be done by 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 your county emergency management department. And so um, and so they put in a STAR request for me to receive the medications, and um, and and we eventually got them from a hospital. And so that's 
And again, this is a uh, something that would be done regardless of COVID-19. If there was something else, Correct. this is a path of which you would go through Correct. to get this medication for your patients as a Absolutely. doctor to these patients, right? <laughs> again, it's not political. It's how the process works. Um, so I'll tell you, so, so I'll tell you, if, if the news reporters actually watch this interview, they're going to learn a whole lot. I agree. That, that, that they really didn't ask me about or, <laughs> or didn't, right. didn't really. It was, much. it was so disheartening seeing some of what the, the headlines and the tweets and how they praised them and how they, you know, made it look, uh, uh, for you. And and again, you are a doctor who is trying to heal his patients, which is, and I don't care what side of the aisle you're on, right? This is, uh, people just want to know what's working and how it's looking. And, and um, so this is awesome information. Let me ask you another thing. Did any of your patients have to be put on a ventilator? Did they have to get to the hospital? Did it con continue on? Um, you know, give me a little bit of information on no, that. No, no, we had, um, so none of our patients had to be put on a ventilator. Uh, we had, uh, we had a few patients, maybe two patients that went to the hospital, mm. but they were for actually unrelated reasons. One lady went because she was, um, becoming very, she had had a fall and she was becoming very dehydrated. Mm. And then, then another lady actually went, um, and these are all patients that we treated. So I'm just talking about the patients that we treated. Uh, and we had another lady that went uh, to the hospital for dialysis because it was a big logistical problem getting her dialysis in her regular center because the regular dialysis centers weren't wanting to to take COVID-19 patients because they didn't want to spread it there. Mm. And so, and so, um, so the, um, physician, the dialysis physician, the nephrologist just decided to leave him in the hospital to get dialysis during this episode until she tested negative for COVID-19. And so, and so that was about it. We had some other patients that, um, we had one other patient that went, uh, to the hospital. Um, and, but he, he had, he was COVID negative when he left and then he, eventually became COVID positive. He was not someone who we had really gotten started on the medications and, and he actually passed away. Mm. And so, so we may not have gotten him started early enough, you know, I think mm. on the medications. And so um, he went to the hospital for a while and eventually um, passed away. But, um, but for the, for our, our cohort group, we've actually had really, you know, really good success and um, and so that's my next question. How many? What is your numbers on the, those that came down with COVID nineteen? What did you say? How many have come through it? Um, so we treated. So we treated. We treated thirty eight patients um, on on our regimen, and we've had one that passed away. Mm. And so we've had um, well, probably two. Two. We've had two that died. Two that died. One. One died of COVID nineteen. Um, the other one died um, of consequences, and she was 102 years old, and so she was very, she's very elderly. Uh, oh. but she actually passed away, but she was passed away after you know she had recovered from the COVID-19. Is actually, that right? So she recovered at 102. She recovered, yeah. and then oh my goodness! Yeah. And these, you know, these. This is what's so frustrating to me too, because in a time of pandemic, when people are very nervous, this isn't something that's hit our country, really. I mean, of late, I should say, right? Um, and it's it's a scary thing. And we need these kinds of stories of hope and good as well. We don't want to, you know, we don't want to act like everything is, uh, we don't want to make things rosier than they are. We just want the right. facts, right? So, uh, you know, somebody that's 102 that's um, uh, healed from that is an amazing story um, in of itself. So, you know, you said, uh, you said, who who we have treated with our regimen? Remind people what your regimen was. That a combination? Uh, you mentioned yeah, it was. Okay. It was hydroxychloroquine, and, and so they took 400 milligrams on day one, and then two the 400 milligrams twice a day on day one, and then 200 milligrams twice a day on days two through five, and then azithromycin 500 milligrams on day one, and then 250 milligrams on on days two through five, and then zinc. 220 milligrams once a day for all five days. And so that was it. So just that, wow. that's the five day regimen. And wow. then we checked EKGs on them because the big, big uh, concern amongst uh, medical people is the prolongation of the QTC interval. And what that is, is that's an EKG finding that predisposes you to having ventricular arrhythmias or 
cardiac arrest, sudden, sudden cardiac death. And so we did EKGs on all of our patients, and it showed that the combination of hydroxychloroquine with azithromycin does not did not prolong the QTC interval in any of our patients. And so, and so that was a um, that was a really really um, positive finding, and that's that's significant because some of the small studies out of China show that if you use the two meds together, you actually re- can reduce the viral load by day six to zero. And so that's why it's wow. A regimen. And so and so that's and that's um, that's why we thought it was important to to use both the medications. Um, a lot of organizations are recommending to not use both of the medications, but we actually use both. And, and, and I think we saw more efficacy using both. And, and I think that in a lot of ways, we have shown that, that you don't get the cardiac effects that has been reported. And Got so, it. Um, because we, we, that, that's a significant finding that really would be counter to everything that 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 the medical community is saying at this time. Are you getting a lot of other nursing homes calling y'all uh, asking Absolutely. for advice? Absolutely, from, from all over the country. Absolutely, I bet. And I so bet. From all over the country, all over the world. In fact, you know, I got wow. a letter from someone in Australia saying, you know, we really appreciate you know your use of this medication and 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 thank you, you know. And so so this is um you know this really is the biggest you know for for. You know, there was an article in Rolling Stone magazine about this. Okay, God. Rolling Stone magazine. It was not a kind article. They they basically piggyback from the NPR article, mm. but 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 and it was negative. It's, but to me, this is this is the biggest non-story huh. out there. You know, I mean, it's just it just just it's just not really even a story. And I, I guess what makes it novel is that we are probably the first group to treat patients like this in a nursing home setting. Mm. So we're, we're the first, we're probably the first in the United States to do that. Mm. Um, um, and so I think that's what makes it novel, but, but we're certainly not going to be the first. In, I mean, we're, we're the first, but we're not going to be a oh, lot because wow. there are You're a lot right. of us that are doing it now. Um, they're seeing some success. And so it, it's going to be really interesting to see what the medical establishment has to say and what the media has to say when I when I think it's going to be proven effective. Right. So we have somebody on the Texan staff who has a father. Her father is in a nursing home, and she's devastated that during all of this, she cannot visit him. Sure. Um, let's talk about the personal aspect of people being in a nursing home without their family mm-hmm. there for them during this trying time. Um, is there anything, I mean, I don't know. I mean, obviously, what what can what advice can you give to legislators, to lawmakers, to people? What could be done better so that there? I don't know that there can be, I, I, and that's what I want to hear from you because obviously, families want to be there with their loved ones in these nursing homes. They understand the restrictions, and yet I, I feel like those in the nursing homes once they want their families there. Is there a better way? Is there uh, rather than across the board you can't go in what, what are your thoughts on that well i i think that people i'm glad you asked that question because that's that is significant for yes. people that is and that is so important for an elderly patient who probably deals with some dementia mm-hmm. um they're they're used to seeing their family and and then they're not able to and they, they're not able to see their family for a couple of months i talked to nursing home directors who thinks that this is probably going to go on for a while you know that that the nursing homes are going to be the very last that that sort of get back to work, so to speak. Mm-hmm. You know, because they're a vulnerable population, and and they're the they're the it's the hardest to to prevent spread in nursing homes as well. <clears throat> what I think that we can do, what I think that legislators can do, is, is and, I, and I think the nursing homes are going to start doing this as well. CMS is going to make this a guideline that 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 you just can't have shared employees anymore. You know, I mean, uh, share employees. And that's been a huge thing that has helped reduce some of the costs. Many of these nursing homes are really not, they, they, they're, they're being really squeezed pretty hard. Mm-hmm. The regulators are, are, are asking for more and more and more and more and more, but the compensation is less and less and less. And so I think that if we're going to ask these facilities to take care of some of the most valuable people in our society, Yep. Now, certainly they're not producing, 
but they're exceedingly valuable in wisdom and what they've given us and they've taken care of us and they've raised us. You know, I always say to people, and I, I, I've never heard anybody say this, so I, 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 I think I made it up anyway. <laughs> but but I, I, say, I say the tra- trajectory of a society, it, you can determine the trajectory of, trajectory of where a society is going based on how they treat their very old and based on how they treat their very young. And so we're, we're, we're aborting babies on the front end and, mm. and, and, and we're not really loving and caring for our elderly on the back end. And mm. so I think it's, it's vital that, that, that we make sure that, that we support these nursing facilities, give them the resources that they need so that they don't have to share employees. You know, if, if nursing homes were not sharing employees, then we would not have had these clusters. It just would not have happened. We would not have have had the spread in the nursing homes that we've seen. That's one way one way you can control it. Another thing I think can be done is is once you 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 you, you see a pandemic coming along. We saw what happened in Washington State. We saw what happened in Richmond, Virginia, with those nursing homes where you had large numbers of people die. What 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 we should do now is we should have when this starts, we should have a nursing home that takes care of all of the COVID-19 patients. And so when you have COVID-19 positive people in a nursing home, I think that you should you should you should set one up to be the, the, the nursing home that takes care of all those patients. You can put all those patients in one nursing facility, have specialized care for them, close monitoring and care for them, and then you you you, you remove a lot of the other from the other nursing homes, COVID-19 patients. So they're not infecting other people. Right. And so I think that's something that you just have to do. It just makes sense from a from a um, from a um, just a, a, a epidemiologic perspective to do that. And, and then it also makes sense because the COVID-19 folks, you can give them very specialized care and treatment. You know, you could actually even give that nursing facility more resources so that they can take care of these folks and get them through it because most elderly folks are going to survive a COVID-19 infection, you know, but you just have a large percentage that generally do not. And so I think they just need a lot more TLC, a lot lot more care, a lot more focus. And so I think from a legislative uh, um, perspective, that's something that you can do. You can, you can have them, you know, you know, cohort them in one nursing facility give them specialized care, give that facility more resources to be able to care for them. And then, so you separate those out from other facilities so you don't get many, many nursing homes with with with, with this problem. And then so, do you think that that would afford, I don't know, I don't know that uh, you would suggest or anybody would, would want this, but it, do you think that would afford those uh, nursing home patients that are not in that situation than to be visited by their family on a normal yes, basis. Yes, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Right. right. Yeah, you that's have what they to, need. Absolutely. You would not have to. And I think, I think um, obviously you'd be concerned about family members bringing, bringing right. it in, you know, right. and so, and so you'd certainly have to screen them very aggressively and, and then you'd probably have them wear masks, you know, and right. you'd, you'd, you'd probably limit the visitation time. But, but boy, I think it would be significant if you could have family members continuing to visit their loved ones. Absolutely. That's something that is vital to, to the survival of many of these folks, especially if they have some dementia. So right. yeah, I think it would it would free you up to do that more for sure. Absolutely. And that's uh, I 100 percent agree with what you said about our, you know, from uh inception, conception, excuse me, to end of life, you know, how we treat both ends is very important as a society. And I'm with you, amen, to everything you said about that uh, and appreciate your thoughts on that. Um, how is your family doing? Are y'all doing okay? Has anybody been infected? Um, We're doing well. We're doing well. Um, you know, we've we've not had any symptoms at all. Um, I was telling my wife, my wife says, you know, Robin, you need to get tested. You need to get tested. I was like, well, I've not had any symptoms at all. So I was telling her that, honestly, I mean, I have probably been more protected than just about anybody because I've been working with COVID-19 patients every day. And so I I have had the gloves on. I've had the, the shield on. I've had the N95 mask on. I've had the gown on, the shoe covered. I mean, I've had the whole works. And so I've, I've probably been protected more than just about anybody working with these patients. Now, certainly it's a risk, you know, it's sure. a risk working with them and you can be infected. But, 
but 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 from a from a practical perspective, I've probably been been more protected because I'm 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 shielded every day I go to work. Right, exactly. And so, uh, and so yeah, so it's been good. So our our families were your family's doing yeah, great. Well. Good, good. All right, one last before we I have something I want to ask before we wrap it up. And so the masks, that's a big deal. I don't know where it seems like we went from zero to 100, you know, what we were told and what I've always understood, you know, unless you're immunocompromised, right. you know, what you need to do is wash your hands. And, you know, if, if you've been touching things before you you know, touch your face, wash your hands, right? right? That's the way you transmit diseases, always, always. So uh, what is your recommendation on masks for people, for the general population who are not immunocompromised? What what would you say? Should people wear masks out and about? Is it more important just to wash your hands? What What's your advice? You know, so I, I think that masks, masks are important to, to protect other people from you, okay, from the individual wearing the mask. Right. And so I think that's the most important thing because it's the, the, the virus is not airborne, so the virus is just not floating through the air, and, and it's not going to be infecting people just like if I, if I breathe on you, you know, you're not going to get the virus. Um, and so, but, but it is easily transmitted because we oftentimes don't realize how much we wipe our eyes. You know, it's transmitted right. fluid. It's, it's a droplet precaution. And so it's transmitted via fluid. And so we might wipe our eyes and then shake someone's hand. You right. know, and so you, you've just got the got the, the fluid from your eyes, which is infected on someone else's hand that way. They wipe their eyes and then they're infected. And right. so we, we don't realize how much we touch our face. You know, I, I actually realize it now just in this whole thing. <laughs> Because, I think we all do. <laughs> and so it's like, oh my goodness, I've like touched my face five times and I haven't even thought about it. And so now we're thinking about it, you know? <laughs> and so, and so I, it just, I think that that is vitally important. I, I don't think the masks are, are personally, you know, I know that a lot of jurisdictions are saying, you know, you should always wear a mask. I don't personally think it's all that important to wear a mask. Um, I think if you're wearing a mask, you're trying to protect others from you when you sneeze or when you cough, because one thing that's different is the virus is more easily transmitted, for sure. For every person infected, um, the, 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 the evidence shows that they infect two and a half to three people. And so that's pretty tr easily transmitted. Sure, uh, sure. And so um, and so and then and then and then it's just it's easy transmitted and it actually lives on surfaces for a bit longer than, right? than, yeah. than many other viruses do as well. So it can actually live on surfaces for up to 48 hours. Oh, and OK. Good so, to know. OK. So if I were to sneeze on a computer, mm -hmm. on a computer keyboard, uh -huh. you know, someone comes and types on that computer keyboard and, and, and gets the, they could get the virus that way. Okay. So it is very easy. So, so the mask is used to protect others from you. Right. Uh, and so, and so it, and that's the main thing. And, and so I think, I think, you know, I, I, I say, you know, I think people should have the option on wearing a mask. Sure. I really do. I, I don't think that people should be forced to wear a mask. I, I think that they may be a little excessive, you know, um, and, 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 then we're, and we're also dealing with a virus that, where the, the mortality rate really is not that high for this virus. You know, certainly you lose 45,000 people in the United States, and that's a big number, but we probably, I think I think H1N1, we lost like 61,000 or so people. Yes. And, 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 so, and so, and I think, you know, this is, um, the, you know, the denominator is a lot bigger than what we even know. You know, there's a lot of folks out there who have had who have been infected with COVID-19 who never knew it. That's right. um, you know, there's a lot of folks who said, you know, wow, I was sick in January and boy, I feel <laughs> bad, you know, and I didn't know what it was. I, I bet you this was it. You know, well, it probably was. You know? me, I did the same thing. I haven't had um, flu like uh, disease in forever. And I think right. it was January. And I mean, I was down and out for a good right. seven days and assumed it was the flu and perhaps it could have been, but as I'm saying the same thing. Hmm, I wonder if it was COVID-19, you know, cause I didn't get tested. And most, and most healthy people are going to do fine. That's you know, right. the mortality rate is going to probably end up being, you know, far less than 1%, you know? And so, and so we just have to protect 
those vulnerable populations, those folks who are chronically ill and, and our elderly population. Those are the folks who we need to protect. And so we, I think in a lot of ways, we've done a lot of this to protect our, our disabled and infirmed population, because those are the ones who are mostly affected by this. I'm, I've sort of become kind of a COVID expert. And so every every <laughs> young person who gets it, you know, and, and, and at the medical staff of, of the hospitals around here, you know, they call me and I say the same thing. I say, you're probably going to be fine. Right. You know, more than like odds are overwhelming that you're going to be fine. You're going to live through this. You know, you might have some fevers. You know, you might have a little bit of a dry cough, but but you're probably going to get through this and fine. Now, if you start having symptoms, then, then then give me a call and we can, you know, maybe arrange for you to see someone. But uh, but I think most people are going to be OK. I think we're uh, making masks mandatory for everyone is a little excessive. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that, that most people don't, do not need them. And right. um, and I think and I'm hoping that. As as the summer months come, this will this will dry up with the heat and humidity, and respiratory viruses kind of go away for a while. Um, I do have concern about, about the fall and winter coming up because right. it, this certainly could be a um, a seasonal uh, thing, just like the flu, and so uh, that's concerning. And so I'm hoping that you know we'll have a vaccine fairly soon. Everyone says 18 months. I think it'll probably be sooner than that. Do you, you know, do? I think, Interesting. I, 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 I sure hope so. I sure I think that's going to be the case. You know, I you know, uh, you know, medical professionals are very risk averse, you know, and so we so and we're very um, so we don't like to go out on a limb. And, and the last thing we want to do is say, you know, we'll have a vaccine in three months and then not have one in 18 months. So 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 we'd, we'd lot rather like to <laughs> we'd rather say, you know, Pitch we're not going to have a vaccine in 18 months and then have one in five months. You know, right. yeah, <laughs> so, absolutely. I think we're all kind of that way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so the medical community is that way in in, in excess. Well, uh, interesting. <laughs> so, Very interesting. So I'm hoping that we'll have a vaccine fairly soon. I'm, I'm hoping we will. Good, good. Well, this has been so enlightening. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. On top of the fact that I know that today happens to be your birthday as yes. well. So happy birthday, Dr. Well, Armstrong. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And my goodness, for you to come on here and give us all this interesting and uh, great information um not through the lens of media <laughs> i was gonna say liberal media. Yeah, i'm gonna go ahead and say it because it's true right again uh you know the liberal media who wants to make it a, 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 a political issue when it's very much a medical issue it's you know we all care about ourselves our family and society and we just want to get the facts and so this has been so helpful. I appreciate it so very, very much. And, Absolutely. Um, and, and, I, and I think that people would be very interested as well. I mean, people on a national too. scale. I mean, I'm, I get calls from all over the country all the time now, and the people are very interested. So, so I'd love to, to, to get this out as, as much Absolutely. as we can. We're going to get it out as soon as possible. And again, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Armstrong. We'll be uh, talking to you soon. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. If you've been enjoying our podcast, it would be awesome if you would review us on iTunes. And if there's a guest you'd love to hear on our show, give us a shout out on Twitter. Tweet at the Texan News. We're so proud to have you standing with us as we seek to provide real journalism in an age of misinformation. We're paid for exclusively by readers like you. So it's important we all do our part to support the Texan by subscribing and telling your friends about us. God bless you and God bless Texas. Texas.